In the heart of London lives Glyn Robbins. This university professor is one of the leaders of Don't Pay UK, a growing protest movement. So I'm packing my bag, ready to go to 10 Downing Street for this evening's protest. Like all Britons, Glyn has seen his gas and electricity bills almost double in a year. With another sharp rise on the cards, Glyn and the Don't Pay UK campaigners aren't going to take it lying down. The Don't Pay campaign has kind of latched on to this as a slogan, and I suppose in that sense is suggesting a form of this civil disobedience of, of refusing to pay these bills which are doubling, um, have already gone up by 80%. So much a question of don't pay as can't pay for millions of people. On the day Liz Truss, a former Conservative Prime Minister, was appointed, Glynn and his movement decided to use the opportunity to strike a blow. In the heart of Westminster, a stone's throw from Big Ben, Parliament and the rest of the government buildings. This is the seat of power. All of these are government buildings, so this is the state. In England, demonstrations are extremely rare. Usually protests look like this, a few activists organising gatherings on the pavement in an effort to spread their message. Like these anti-Brexit activists here. The demonstrators were blocked from approaching the famous front door of 10 Downing Street the official residence of the Prime Minister. The street is gated and heavily guarded. Outside, Glynn met up with other members of the Don't Pay movement. And there's a bunch of leaflets in here also. The profile, mostly middle class and young people who didn't know each other until coming together independently of any trade union or political party. The movement took off on social media and now involves over 200,000 people across the country. Can't pay, won't pay, we say don't pay. Can't pay, won't pay, we say don't pay. Free from it, people. Their goal, to rally one million protesters to stop paying their bills simultaneously in the hope of paralyzing energy suppliers and thus demand lower prices. For many here, it's a matter of survival. We're both teachers. Uh, we've only recently moved in together. Our bills have absolutely skyrocketed in the past months alone and they're only set to go up more and people are estimating that our annual bills might be up to five, six thousand pounds, which on teacher salaries, you know, given the inflation rates are well above 10 percent at the moment, it's unaffordable. Any sort of quality of life if you're watching every penny and like you mentioned about the cafes and the restaurants they can't afford it people aren't going to attend they're going to close it's just going to become like a dead society where nobody goes out and everybody's just cold at home Free not people Free not today there are only a hundred or so protesters but Glynn has hope the last time he demonstrated was in 1990 against a poll tax introduced by Margaret Thatcher the United Kingdom went up in flames, 17 million demonstrators and riots throughout the country, which eventually led to the fall of the Iron Lady. Two days later, Liz Truss announced a limit increase to 27% instead of 80. But anger still continued to grow. Nearly one in four Britons now live below the poverty line, amounting to over 15 million impoverished. The country is broke. Her Majesty's supporters salute their Queen for the last time, while wondering how they'll get through the winter. An issue that the new monarch was quick to address. My lords, pray be seated. The then Prince Charles replaced Queen Elizabeth at the opening ceremony of Parliament. Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy 
and help ease the cost of living for families. The paradox of the world's sixth largest economy, a kingdom of entrepreneurial freedom and flourishing fortunes with 177 billionaires driven by the dynamism of London and its suburbs, the country has a historically low unemployment rate of 3.5%. But for millions of Britons, work no longer pays the bills. They are the working poor who struggle to make ends meet and are sometimes forced to resort to fraud to survive. I'm basically stealing electricity, which is illegal. And for me to do that is disgusting. The other face of England, a society without a safety net, where after a decade of austerity, social assistance for families has been cut in half. Unseen since the Second World War, the human toll is disastrous. They just stopped his support. He was four and a half stone when he died. This is how the state is treating vulnerable people. That just shouldn't happen. Faced with the government's inadequacy, the British people organized themselves in a tremendous show of solidarity. What pizza or pasta? The number of food banks has increased 50-fold since 2010. And while public services are disappearing, thousands of volunteers are taking over, particularly in the transport sector. Good morning. I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid anything. Some predict a humanitarian catastrophe to come if nothing is done to help the most disadvantaged. An investigation into the kingdom of those forgotten by the crown. Leighton Buzzard. Population 38,000 is 40 minutes from central London, a residential suburb where life usually runs smoothly. The town is far from being a disaster area, and yet on market days, around the stalls, inflation is on everyone's minds. In one year, food prices have risen by 14%, the highest since 2008. So when Naomi and Stuart go shopping, two young executives, aged 38 and 42, they are extra vigilant. Thank you. I'm always comparing um, the, how expensive it is now compared to how it was six or 12 months ago. Um, things have got more expensive and there's also less choice as well. We can't um, afford to not be diligent now. We need to be a little bit more careful uh, with what we spend our money on, especially now that we've got a baby. Like many Britons, the couple have seen prices skyrocket and they don't expect much from the new monarch. I hope that he is thinking, this is crazy, what's going on? We need to really help, help and um, change the way the country is uh, being governed at the moment. Um, however, I suspect very little will be done. Yet the family is far from poor. They own a nice house in a suburban neighborhood. Naomi is an executive at a car manufacturer and Stuart is a computer salesman. A typical middle-class couple who until now haven't had to fear for their economic situation. But now, despite an income of £3,500 a month, the couple has started to ration the heating. It's not very hot in here, is it? Uh, that's because uh, we only heat one room at a time. Uh, so my other half, he's working in the kitchen at the moment. Um, and so the radiator has been on in the kitchen uh, just this morning for an hour. Now we're being very, very careful because the price keeps on going up. Since her maternity leave ended, Naomi has had no income. But she is reluctant to return to work as she cannot afford a full-time nanny. This is also the case for her sister, Alexandra. Come in. Mwah. We've put the heating on for an hour. <laughs> oh. How are you? She is also How's unable to yesterday? get childcare for her two children. Um, the usual. She's a civil servant yeah. in the Ministry of Justice. We probably won't talk about it. But she and her husband recently had to work part-time to avoid paying for a nanny. For two children during the school holidays, the childminder would have cost me £120. My net pay for a day is about £80. It doesn't make sense for me to work. A job that no longer pays, an economic situation that is deteriorating. For the first time in 25 years, Alexandra confesses that she can no longer make ends meet. 
I'm overdrawn now. Um, and I'm trying to cut things. It, well, it makes me very anxious, actually. I know there are people in a much worse situation than me, but I worked so hard for that. And if a woman cannot be a professional and afford to live in a house and have the heating on occasionally when it's cold and to clothe the children, then there's something not right, is there? Something's not working. A middle class that is starting to tighten its belt, while for the poorest, the situation is already catastrophic. In the northwest of the country lies the poorest town in England, bordering the Irish Sea, Blackpool. A seaside resort built around a replica of the Eiffel Tower that is half the size of the original. Like its big sister, it also attracts hordes of tourists every year. <laughs> You've got the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. Tower. We've we got Blackpool Tower. Tower. And I'm sure there's some history about who got which one first, isn't there? Yeah. So did you copy us? <laughs> 18 million visitors every year who come here for the tower, but also for the fun fairs on the piers, the rides, and gambling. Four, two and seven, we've got a bingo. It's a bit like the uh, Las Vegas of England, really. The life of the city is concentrated on a single street, the Golden Mile, a seaside boulevard with dozens of attractions, restaurants and souvenir shops. It's been operating like this since the middle of the 19th century. The first tourists were workers in the mines, factories and spinning mills. After the Second World War and until the early 1980s, Blackpool was a thriving seaside resort with beaches that were always crowded. The emergence of low-cost airlines plunged the little town into a long decline, allowing Britons to fly to sunny beaches on the other side of the world. For Blackpool, it was the end of their golden days. Today, in the city which has one in three jobs linked to the tourism industry, people are still dreading the arrival of worse days. It's such hard, hard to get work here. A lot of shops close down for winter and then it, obviously they reopen, but everyone's looking for work constantly. On the last days of summer, the town hall organises a large fireworks display on the beach, which attracts tens of thousands of visitors every year. The last light before winter. Winter lasts for six months and leaves thousands of people homeless. Just a block behind the seafront, the real face of the seaside town, slum housing, derelict hotels and abandoned shops. Of the ten poorest areas in England, eight are here in Blackpool. One of the few lights that shines throughout the winter is Mark Butcher's pizzeria sign, a restaurateur and pastor who has declared a war on poverty. OK, guys, only about five minutes now. All right. No problem. All right. Two evenings a week before the first customers arrive, Mark, 51, opens his restaurant to Blackpool's poorest people. This evening, there are already over 20 of them. Are you coming and sitting down? Yeah. Good. In, you're sitting in, good. You're bringing the dog in, come on. Come on, love, you're, hey, you're welcome as well. Come on. Tonight, at this place, we'll probably serve 10% of the community that we're serving will be homeless. The rest of the people are just short on money. They're probably waiting to get paid. They've probably had a big electric bill. Well, they're not feeding themselves. A growing phenomenon that doesn't only affect the people of Blackpool. In the UK, over 7 million adults and 2.6 million children struggle to afford food. Pizza, 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 pizza. On the menu this evening, free pizzas and friendly warmth. For many like Becky, her husband and their two children, the restaurant owner's hospitality is a lifesaver. We do love pizza. Thank you. Tuesday and Friday. 
that's the only hot meals we have here. Because we're homeless at the moment. Living in temporary accommodation. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, we've met quite a lot of people that are in the same situation. Never take anything for granted now. <laughs> To fund his generosity, Mark has come up with an ingenious system. In addition to their order, ordinary customers at his restaurant can buy a solidarity pizza. In other words, a prepaid meal which will be served free of charge to those in need. So if they come here and pay a pizza forward, they know they're getting a meal. So it's, it, it makes you feel secure when you're giving, that you're giving to somebody who's going to need a meal. And when we serve the pizzas, they, the customers they know, this isn't free, it's been paid for. Your pizzas tonight have all been paid for by strangers. Mark's system is so successful that his pizza shop has become one of Blackpool's leading charities. Every week, 400 people eat here for free, and demand is exploding. Thank you. Faced with this level of need, the restaurant owner has taken it as his mission. A big weight's on my shoulders, because if I don't get the food, people, they go hungry. His pizza oven never stops. Mark Butcher is now the town saviour. Boom, just like that. Boom. Yet, until a few years ago, there was no indication that he would be capable of such a task. As a child in Blackpool, Mark grew up far from the attractions of the seaside in the poorest parts of the town. In the middle of the Thatcher years, when poverty had already exploded. At the time, the restaurateur and his family were feared offenders. We had a nickname on here. Uh, we was called the Butchers. My surname is Butcher, so we was called the Butchers. You start off with petty crime, you're stealing bikes, you're robbing cars. And then you move on. You move up the, the ladder and you go from one stage to another. And so that's what happened. It's like it's poverty breeds this. A violent adolescence that was turned upside down when his brother David, a drug addict, was murdered in a drug deal. I saw my brother die. I watched the, the hell on earth. I lived, you know, a life of hell really as a young boy growing up and so but I made a cho I made a choice when I was 33 years of age to change everything following the murder of his brother Mark found faith and became a Christian evangelist 18 years after the tragedy he was a new man but the good Samaritan is still very much affected by his years of trauma his experience now helps him to understand what the lost souls who knock on his restaurant's door are going through Tonight, two homeless people who have recently arrived in Blackpool are looking for a helping hand. Gary and Thomas are in a desperate situation. I lost my wife a couple of months ago, and I just give up on everything. I had my own business, I had someone's nice house, everything, and just, just couldn't be bothered anymore. Found myself here and sleeping on the streets, and now I'm addicted to heroin. I only take it to to mask away the pain of living on the streets. You feel sick, you, you can't think straight unless you've, you've had the heroin, and then you feel normal. You know, just take it to feel normal. But I think your man probably needs some real help. Just go and get your coffee, lads. Keep you warmed up. Get by that radiator. Mark knows all about the dangers of heroin. At 11 euros a gram, it's very easy to source, especially in Blackpool. He believes that Gary and Thomas are in mortal dangers if they spent the night out in early winter. And heroin just, it's a really deceiving drug because it makes you feel like everything's okay, but of course it isn't. And, and they die in the cold, they don't even feel the cold. You don't meet many 50-year-old heroin addicts. Most 50-year-old heroin addicts are dead. In 2021, with over 6,200 overdose deaths, the United Kingdom alone accounted for one-third of all overdoses in Europe. A growing scourge that hits the poorest people hardest. Mark's wife, Abby, calls Blackpool Social Services to try to find emergency accommodation. He's a heroin addict, but he's, he's, very, he's not like your typical heroin addict. He's, he's wanting to get clean, he's, he's had enough. His wife's recently died. 
So, Gary, this is uh, EDT, so it's out of hours housing for social services. So she's just going to ask you a few questions and then obviously see if we can get you somewhere for tonight. Hello. Thank you very much. It is, yes. Blackpool Social Services do have emergency accommodation, but refuse to help the two homeless people as they are not from the area. They've said that these two men have got no local connections, therefore they are not responsible for them. It's old-fashioned policy of just because somebody comes from a different postcodal area, why does that mean that we can't help them? And all the council can offer us in this dire situation is a travel warrant back to the place that they don't want to be. I feel like dirt just pushed to the side. We are in the shit, boys. <laughs> Since 2011, the state has cut subsidies to municipalities by 50%. As a result, their social services now refuse to help those who cannot prove a local connection. This policy has caused the number of homeless people in the country to jump by 140%. Gary and Thomas, strangers to Blackpool, are not welcome here. Fortunately, Abby calls upon her own networks and ends up finding them a warm place to sleep. <laughs> I'm so happy, I just can't believe it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> We need help. We need help, that's all. The sound doesn't Someone help me one. It's not, it's not, I wouldn't that's it. do it to you. That's all we're doing. Someone help me yeah. one. The owner of a small hotel in the town, a woman who suffered from domestic abuse, whom Mark and Abby helped in the past, has agreed to let them have a room for the night. Here we are, home sweet home. Yes. Let's have it, boys. Come in. Welcome, oh. welcome, welcome. Thank you. A bed for the night, eh? Bed in a warm, a warm bed. Wow. TV, new car, caviar, it's a four-star day dream. Wow. Isn't it, boys? Hey, bit of a shower. Shower, warm wow. night. I'm stuck for words. I really am. I can't believe how, how things have changed in the past, I don't know, two, two and a half hours. This is going to be like heaven. Thank boys. You. Thank you very much. Good night and God bless. Let's do a little prayer. Father, we just want to get better. We just want to become better men. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? Amen. Come on, boys. Tonight, Mark and his wife, Abby, probably saved two lives, at least for now. It's not just the homeless who are suffering from budget cuts. All social benefits in the country have been slashed over the last 10 years. On the outskirts of Manchester, Ashton under line, population 43,000. This town was the very first in the UK to experiment with universal credit, a single welfare payment that merges six benefits, from unemployment benefits to disability pensions, including housing benefits. This was in 2013 under David Cameron's Conservative government, and the impact has been disastrous across the UK, starting with Ashton the former cotton weaving capital of the UK, which has been hit hard by deindustrialization. The reform was denounced by a local activist, Charlotte Hughes, a journalist whose inflammatory articles inspired a famous film director. That's myself and Ken Loach, the writer and the filmmaker. Ken did communicate with me and he used part of the script to the film, part of the film based on some things that I'd, I'd wrote about at the job centre. The film I, Daniel Blake, which was awarded the Palme d'Or at Cannes, describes the grotesque struggle of unemployed people against job centres. Je vous demande de vous engager, ça suffit ma situation, et vous vous en foutez. Il me reste pas un rond dans mon porte-monnaie. C'est vous qui faites une scène, d'accord Non, de Dieu Qui est le prochain à passer C'est moi. Ça vous dérange si cette jeune mère s'inscrit avant vous Non, non. Ce qu'on va faire, c'est que je vais vous prier de sortir tout de suite. Their word is the most important thing to me. Not about me, it's about what they want and what they think. You know, and the way that the government treats them. This is what happened to Charlotte's daughter, Eleanor. Six months pregnant, the Ashton Underline Job Centre asked her to do community service if she wanted to keep her benefits before suspending her payments, deeming her unable to work due to her condition. Ever since, Charlotte has been at war with the Department of Labour. Don't 
Don't be surprised if they phone the police. <laughs> so every Thursday for the past eight years, Charlotte and her youngest daughter, Talula, have been protesting at the Ashton Job Centre. Since the reform of universal credit, the job centres no longer only deal with the unemployed. They also distribute benefits for pregnant women, families, the disabled and housing allowances. A sort of one-stop shop, a must for all those who need social assistance to live. It's awful now. There's like, they've got desks with numbers on now. It's awful. Charlotte isn't allowed in, so she hands out leaflets at the door. Um, would you like a leaflet? And, would you like a leaflet, darling? It'll help. In this leaflet, a method to help them challenge the job centre's decisions in court. Are you going in the job centre? Yeah. Like a leaflet, darling. Help you, I'll tell you what they don't sell you. Good luck. Good luck. The most important thing is, is that when you make a claim from the job centre, and if you go to, have to go to tribunal, which often is the case, you've got all the proof that you've got, all the evidence. What Charlotte denounces is the policy of arbitrary sanctions left to the side judgment of the councillor, which creates an environment of unease. This man, for example, was struck off after missing a simple phone call from the job centre. I explained to him, I said, look, I can't afford to pay my mobile phone bill. They're they cutting me off. Yeah. The DWP will sanction yeah, yeah. No question. If you don't answer a phone call yeah, to yeah. them... You get caught. Yeah. They don't give monkeys if you've got any money in your struggle. All they care about is you doing what they tell you to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. If you don't do what they tell you to do, that's it, they cut your money off. Arbitrary bans and there's more. Some decisions by job centres are set to be made without taking into account the health status of the recipients. Like this man with a crutch. Look at my leg, yeah? I see my leg. Yeah. This, Jesus. This is because of the doll. Their doctors said, you can go. I've got a bulging disc on my spine and I've got a leg that's had an hip operation and it's I ripped it apart because of the doll. I have three years of my life on £43 a week as a disabled man. I couldn't feed myself. They've got no clue about how these people have to, have to survive. They've got no clue about the medical conditions. They're employed to make them fit for work. It's estimated that since its introduction in Ashton nine years ago, Universal Credit and its new rules of allocation have forced 1.5 million people into poverty. One thing is certain, since the different forms of social assistance were merged into one, the number of food banks in the country has exploded. Ten years ago, there were about 50 of them. Today, there are more than 2,800. And among them, Mark, the pizza chef with the big heart. In addition to the traditional hot meals he continues to offer in his restaurant, he now offers emergency bags containing food for several days. All of these bags are for cooking. These blue bags are for people who are genuinely homeless on the street. They have no cooking facilities. People can also help themselves to hygiene products. In England, one in five people can no longer afford them. All these items have been donated by companies or individuals. Donations that are sometimes surprising. Local, local man died and at his funeral they had all of this food. A lot of food was left over. Rather than throw the food away, they brought it to us. A welcome donation as when meals are distributed, Mark's food bank gets really full. More pizza or pasta? Pasta. What's shocking is that this reliance on charities was planned at the highest level of government. In 2010, during the peak of former Prime Minister David Cameron's austerity policies, with this reform of universal credit, the Conservative leader backed massive cuts in social welfare. According to the NGO Human Rights Watch, benefits for families and children were cut by 44%. So to make the pill go down easier, Cameron invented the concept of big society. The big society is about a huge culture change, where people in their everyday lives, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, don't always turn to officials, local authorities or central government for answers to the problems they face, but instead feel both free and powerful enough to help themselves and their own communities. 
Last spring, while the former Prime Minister was on a trip to Paris, we wanted to take the opportunity to ask him about his record on social policies. A few days before our interview, David Cameron proudly posted on Twitter pictures of him helping out at a food bank, a post that was heavily criticised, notably by this opposition MP. In the UK, lots of people have said that the big society was a cover to austerity measures. Now, I, uh, that's, all, that's often said. I think it's simply not true. Uh, whoever had been prime minister in 2010 would have had to take difficult decisions. I don't deny that. And actually, we reduced the budget deficit by two thirds. We ended up with the fastest growing economy in the G7. We created two million jobs, a million more businesses. You know, we recovered the UK economy. The poverty increased. No, well, that's not true. No, I think, look, there has been an increase in the use of food banks, and part of that is because the previous government, before me, they did not allow um, the job centres to refer people to food banks. They didn't want the bad publicity. I think that is bad. You know, if people need help, you should direct them to where there is help available. And my government let that happen. David Cameron is convinced that his policy has stimulated the work of food banks in the country, something for citizens to be thankful for, a view far removed from the economic realities faced by millions of Britons. In the queue at Mark's Food Bank tonight, Graham, an army veteran. Why are you coming here? After working all my life, Royal Marines, civil servant, Ken Brassy office, you know, a lot of places at work. So I'm not going to end up sleeping rough. So I did the work myself to a sufficient standard that I could actually stay in the property. There were no signs to predict that the 58 year old Scotsman would find himself in poverty overnight. Just before the pandemic, Graham Wilson was a craftsman in the building trade. But due to COVID, he went bankrupt and moved to Blackpool to try and get back on his feet. This is basically what they call a studio flat, which is open plan. Living room and bedroom is the one place. Kitchen area, obviously. In his former life, Graham could earn the equivalent of 2,000 euros a month. He now survives on 400 euros in unemployment benefit. After paying his rent, he has nothing left to feed himself and his dog, and even less to heat his home. The British have coined a phrase to describe this dilemma, which affects 16 million people. Heat or eat. I'd never understood the term heat or eat. So you've got to, what do you do? <laughs> Graham has decided that comfort is not an issue. It's 15 degrees here during the day and eight degrees at night. This jacket, I've had this on since six o'clock this morning. Body warmer. Oh, sorry, jumper and T-shirt. So that I could leave that fire off. It's a small fan heater. It doesn't really heat the room. Believe it or not, five hours, that's 10 pounds. Graham knows his precise electricity consumption as he has a meter that works with a rechargeable key. Energy suppliers would come out and fit what they called a prepaid meter, which means that the tenant has to pay for his electricity before he actually receives it. He had no choice. When customers have trouble paying their bills on time, energy suppliers automatically install these prepaid meters. Four million British households are now equipped with them. A few days later, we meet up with Graham. His meter is at zero, so he has to go to the local supermarket to buy some electricity. Can you top my electricity up for me, Lee, please? Thank you. How much would you like? 20, please. There you go. 20 pounds, please. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. 
At 20 pounds, it will only last RAM four days. While electricity is already expensive for everyone in England, electricity sold in this way is charged 10% more than with a conventional meter. Why, if I'm paying them in advance, why have I got to pay them more than the people who are quite wealthy, quite affluent, and there's the lower class people, and they have nothing. They get no concessions, nothing whatsoever. For now, Graham is still managing to pay for his electricity. But winter is coming, and in the north of England, it gets particularly harsh. Such unstable conditions can have a serious impact on health. On the Irish Sea, the port of Fleetwood, population 25,000. Long prosperous, thanks to the fishing industry, but today, rather sinister. The annual per capita income is £3,400 below the national average. And life expectancy here is only 70 years, 10 years less than in the rest of the country. The cause, a cocktail of multiple pathologies and addictions that affect the poorest. The British have a stark expression for this, the shit life syndrome. OK, deep breaths. Okay, yeah, that's all perfectly okay. At the Municipal Health Centre, Dr Spencer has been seeing the worst of this for 30 years. People that we see have multiple health problems. And, and you'll see that in, in, in disadvantaged communities with, with, with poverty. People live with multiple long-term conditions. So you have diabetes, heart disease, you've had a stroke. The, the rates of depression are twice the England average. The functioning of the English public health system, the NHS, in these destitute areas doesn't help. Even though it's free, you have to wait an average of 13 weeks to get an appointment with a GP. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Come this way. But that's not all. It's so crowded that consultations are rushed, even for the seriously ill, like Lisa, who has cancer and a lung infection. Deep breaths. Again. You're really wheezy, aren't you? Really wheezy. The rule here is one consultation per condition, so it doesn't matter if the patient has other symptoms. Right, just really sleep up for me. Yeah. Um, I've got a lot of ear infections. Mm -hmm. But Dr Spencer must stop there. In the UK, the length of consultations is defined by law and is one of the shortest in the industrialised world. See, 10 minutes includes reading the notes, seeing the patient, writing the notes, all of that in 10 minutes. And again, if you noticed, the main problem with Lisa was her infection, but she also wanted to talk about her hearing. And uh, so lots of people will come in and say, as well, as well, as well, as well. Dr. Spencer will write Lisa a prescription, but will not be able to examine her ears. Bye -bye. Like many of his colleagues, he has felt discouraged and almost gave up several times. But the death of one of his young alcoholic patients motivates him to keep going. I said to him, um, if, if you don't stop drinking, it's going to kill you. And, and he said to me, he, he, he said, I, I know you're trying to help me, but it, it's not the thought of dying that stresses me. It's the thought of living. A tragically common story. According to research, suicides, overdoses and cirrhosis are largely due to the lack of social and economic prospects. For a long time, Dr. Spencer tried to deal with it with drugs, but in vain. So, inspired by colleagues, he began to prescribe rather unexpected treatments. At the Fleetwood Stadium, the doctor put his method into practice to fight against the shit-life syndrome. On the field, rather old men, not necessarily athletic, who play walking football. Many have come here on Dr. Spencer's order, who has prescribed these walking football sessions. The doctor works with a professional coach. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, fellas, gather in quickly, please. Remember, walking football, four touch, non contact. Enjoy yourselves, fellas. Dr. Spencer is so convinced of the therapeutic benefits of these hobbies that he has founded a charity offering 77 different activities that improve health, from yoga to gardening to singing. I've seen lots of people come to activities like this and over time can stop taking some of their medication. You become more active, you become more engaging with other people, your, your self-confidence improves. Uh, you know, look, they're, you know, they're, give me the ball, give me the ball, let me play, let me join in. That, that's, that's all because self-confidence is improving. For James, these walking football sessions are a saviour after the long trauma of his wife's death. Well, the mood's much better. I, I can speak to people now where before I were a recluse. You know, I just shied away, went in corners. Didn't want to meet people, but now I can talk to anybody. As for Pete, 73 years old, he has lost 20 kilos and can no longer imagine his life without walking football. I've had heart issues, and this is a great sport that you can still play. What would, uh, would be your health if you were not playing football? Uh, ooh, I don't think I'd probably be here. I seriously don't. Yeah, I don't think I'd be on this planet. A glimmer of hope in Dr. Spencer's ongoing battle to stop the poorest from dying too young. As leading politicians begin to express alarm at the health consequences after years of austerity. In London, at the Palace of Westminster, the British Parliament, some accused the Conservatives in power of having caused the deaths of hundreds of people. Opposition Labour MP Debbie Abrams, for example, is sounding the alarm in front of an almost deserted chamber. This is a scandal. It's a scandal. These are British citizens who are dying as a result of policies implemented by this government. The overall of the welfare system is believed to have killed at least 150 people, according to a BBC investigation. Despite this, all requests for a parliamentary inquiry by Debbie Abrams have gone unanswered. We don't know how many people have taken their lives, have died as a consequence of this. This is why we need this independent inquiry. And I've been pushing for this for a number of years, and I'm not going to, to, to give up. The MP knows some of the families of these welfare victims personally and has been following them for years. Like Philippa Day, a 27-year-old mother. In 2019, after 30 administrative errors, she saw her benefits divided by four and ended her life. This is Errol. Errol died of starvation. He had schizophrenia. The Department for Work and Pensions knew that. And um, they basically uh, sent him letters to show that he he needed to attend assessments and when he didn't reply because he was so mentally unwell they just stopped his support he was four and a half stone when he died this is how the state is treating vulnerable people that just shouldn't happen extreme cases tragic consequences of the state's disengagement from social welfare policies this disengagement has also taken its toll on another area public transport. In the 1980s, the Thatcher government launched a massive privatization of the sector. As a result, more than a quarter of the bus routes were abolished, particularly in the countryside. Rural England has a population of 10 million. One in four are over 65. The majority of them are one hour away from the closest doctor. This isolation was made even worse when the bus routes disappeared. On the border with Scotland and Cumbria, citizens have found a solution. This blue minibus that travels the country roads is now the only link between the villages of the country. Volunteers keep the lines running. <coughs> Behind the wheels this morning, Kate Riona, a retired civil servant of three years. Also on board is Neil, one of the managers of Fellrunner, 
the charity that operates the bus. Good morning. Can I help you with that? No, it's fine. You all right? By operating exclusively with volunteers, the association manages to keep the ticket price at two pounds, just enough to pay for fuel and maintenance. With salaried drivers, the operating costs would be too high and the line would cease to run. I'm a volunteer, I don't get paid anything, um, and I absolutely love it, and I think it's a really important thing to do for the community, to be honest. We have 25 volunteers. After a, a, quite a long training programme of eight weeks, they've passed all their tests, and they'll be let loose with the passengers in the next few weeks. With four minibuses like this one, Fellrunner serves a region the size of Luxembourg and transports 10,000 clients a year, mainly elderly people who depend on public transport and on the solidarity of their community. I'm going to visit my daughter. So without this bus, what would you have done? I couldn't go. I couldn't go because I don't drive. So it's good, yes, yes. Volunteers also play a role that goes beyond simply transporting people. This morning, Neil is worried as an old lady is missing. I shall just go and check that she's OK. Oh, right, OK, that's fine, no problem. Thanks. Oh, dear. Good morning. Good morning. I did phone to say I wouldn't... Oh, I'm to... so sorry no, to have no. bothered you. The drivers are all gentlemen and ladies, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to use it. Not coming today. Once a case, uh, two, three years ago, where... There was uh, another passenger who we knocked at the door and they didn't answer and we knew they had a medical condition and we called the police and the person was in a coma and we rushed them to hospital. So we were glad on that occasion that we knocked at the door. Neil and Catriona's work is crucial for people living in isolated locations. Across England, there are reportedly over 6,000 bus routes run by volunteers. But how sustainable are these measures? How long will citizens be able to make up for the shortcoming of a disengaging state? And how many jobs could be created if the volunteers were paid? In the destitute seaside town of Blackpool, Graham has finally managed to find odd jobs on building sites. But it's not enough to cope with the approaching winter and soaring energy prices. Instead of it costing me 20 pounds a week, it was costing me 40 pounds a week. But because of my situation, I could not afford to keep putting money, money, money into the meter. Today, however, it's 21 degrees in his flat and the television has been on all day, as Graham has made a radical decision. This won't be broadcast on British television, will it? It will be. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I have bypassed it. So my meter is now not connected to the grid at all. So it's not registering, it's not costing me anything. But at the moment, I'm basically stealing electricity, which is illegal. And for me to do that is disgusting. My father was a police officer for 30 years. And the fact that I've actually had to do that is horrific to me. Need to go. Daddy's going to work, OK? Well on. You stay. Good boy. Graham's situation has improved. He works for £80 a day and has found an employer who regularly calls on his services. It was again a good Samaritan, as there are many in England who want to give him a chance. Danny Berber, 28 years old, a small construction company owner, chose to move to the poorest city in England to create jobs. Hey. I employed him and he's in a, a need for employment, so that's one of the biggest reasons why I employed him. He may be old, but don't let age be a factor, I think, in this game. He can, he can do the work. He can do it. Denny employs three people. He specialises in renovation work and there's a lot to do. In England, one out of four privately rented homes are considered unsatisfactory, according to official figures. Today, Danny and Graham go to an elderly woman's home 
with her disabled son to redo the kitchen floor. But you get in there and you sit down and you Thank relax. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. You're very welcome. You're very oh. For it to be affordable for them is vitally important, especially for someone who is disabled. People with their elderly struggle. They're on a pension. The pensions are low. The pensions are massively low these days. Denny makes a big effort for his poorer clients. He asks them to pay for the materials, but funds the labour himself. This morning, it's not just the company manager who is showing solidarity. Today is a free day for Daniel. You need to reverse the mentality and look at what you can give instead of what you can take. Admirable dedication. The big society wanted by former Prime Minister David Cameron seems to have become a reality. But at what cost? Danny and Graham gave half a day's voluntary labour to this project. A nice gesture, but not without consequences. At the small time boss's home, Francis, his wife, is worried. She looks after their two children and the company's accounts, and they just received some bad news. Why would he owe money to the bank? Opening balance, you owe 500 pounds. Danny's business finances are in the red, and he needs to take urgent action. Stay precious. So, mm. just trying to look at what we should pay first. We need to do this by the 24th. If we manage to get this other job, hopefully it'll be like a few days work, won't it? It takes a massive hit on us as a family and us as a business. And this is one of the reasons why we're in the position that we're in. I think a lot of the times we've had to learn to be a bit more, like, separate sometimes. Like, we have to make money on these this work. Yeah. So we have to start to quote more for jobs. Yeah. But it is hard, because especially in Blackpool. A catch-22. How do you raise your prices while trying to help the poorest in England's most deprived city? And we will not give up until we know we cannot, we physically, emotionally, financially, 100%, and we can't do it. While the viability of Danny's projects is in jeopardy, at the other side of the seaside town, Blackpool's most famous pizza chef, Mark Butcher, has come up with a new idea to help those in need. For £15,000, he bought this old double-decker bus. This is it, Julia. Brilliant. The big red night bus. <laughs> the first time you've seen it, isn't it, properly? It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. With Julia and all the other employees of the restaurant, he's going to transform it into a mobile emergency shelter for homeless people and victims of domestic abuse. A £100,000 project, half financed by donations from local benefactors. We've been to see the council. We went to ask them to get some help, and they, they never really offered us anything. Nothing at all, not a, not a single penny. So rejected by the authorities and desperate to make ends meet, Mark had an idea. The advertising awning's going to go along there, Paul Rollies. So it's all going to be wrapped with uh, the advertising awnings. He will sell advertising space to businesses in Blackpool. Once again, Mark is relying on local goodwill to tackle social inequality. But this is going to help the community. This is going to be a game changer for the community, not just the homeless people. This is going to be a game changer for the whole of our community here in Blackpool. Every year, one in ten citizens is involved in a charity. The country has no shortage of hands to fight poverty. But at what cost? Mm -hmm. 